Okay, so now we'll move on to section 1.7, scale and proportion. So both scale and proportion deal with size. It can be a bit confusing to look at them together, so let's define the difference here. Scale is the relative size of a work or object in relation to another work or object or in relation to a system of measurement. So scale means um, something's size in relation to a standard of normal size. Now we typically experience scale in relation to our own size. So for example, in the illustration here, um, we could say that this cube is large scale or monumental in comparison to the um, human figure, or we could say that the human figure is small or minuscule in comparison to the cube. Um, and really, in an artistic composition, the more information we have, as in the more objects we have to compare, um, the better we are able to determine um, scale of objects. So proportion is the relationship in size between a work's individual parts and the whole. So while scale is the relationship of the size of one thing in comparison to another thing. Proportion is the relationship between the parts and the whole, the size of the parts versus the size of the whole thing. Um, the human figure is a great example of this. Generally, artists render the proportions of human figures in terms of an average or idealized body. Um, in the drawing here, Notice that the body is eight squares or eight sections tall, um, each of these being about equal in size. Um, and so you can see the head takes up one square from zero to one there. Um, so the head makes up one eighth of the entire body, which is a pretty naturalistic um, proportion. Now we'll come back to this concept of proportions. We're going to start this lecture um, focusing a bit more on scale. Um, but it's pretty impossible to talk about one without the other, so we'll mention both as we move on. So, scale being the relative size of an object or work in relation to another, um, or in relation to a certain system of measurement. Um, scale can be used to communicate various meanings um, or ideas. For example, works of art can be large scale or monumental. Um, meaning they're massive, um, impressive, sort of larger than life. Um, and large scale can indicate grandeur, maybe wealth or status, heroism. Um, and so um, we have things like Mount Rushmore or the Statue of Liberty. Um, obviously, monuments are monumental in size, right? And these are things that are meant to commemorate um, importance or, you know, heroism, things like that. So it makes sense they would be larger than life. Here we have Michelangelo's David sculpture from 1501 to 04. Um, now this is not a monument per se, but it certainly is monumental in scale. Um, this is made of marble. It was cut from about 18 foot of marble block um, that had already been partially carved by another sculptor during the 1460s and had been damaged by water. So it was um, kind of a precarious material to be working with. But, so I've included some various images of the work being cleaned so that you can see um, just how monumental in scale this work is. The figure is about 17 feet tall, um, which is roughly equivalent to a two-story building um, or a giraffe. Um, and it weighs about 12,500 pounds. Now, this was originally commissioned as one of a series of prophets to go along the roof line of the Florence Cathedral. Um, so the large size is partly because it was going to be viewed from a far distance. You might have noticed in the previous slide that the head and hands seem a bit large. Um, they're not quite proportional to the rest of the body. Um, Michelangelo did this on purpose, and the large head emphasizes the idea of knowledge um, or perhaps of wisdom, whereas the large hands emphasize the action of the story. 
So that story takes place um, when the Israelites and the Philistines are at war. Um, a young shepherd boy named David defeats the giant warrior named Goliath um, using his slingshot and a rock. Um, this is a popular Christian biblical story, um, and it's been depicted many times throughout the history of art. Um, Michelangelo has shown David as a slightly more mature man in a more pensive or contemplative state um, before he goes to battle with Goliath. He has his slingshot thrown over his shoulder, um, as you can see here, and then in his other hand, he's actually holding the rock that he'll use. Um, he's sort of staring off into the distance as if he's waiting or planning for um, his battle here. And so the head is a bit oversized so that it emphasizes his um, his focused expression, his concentration, um, and his hands are oversized so that the viewers will notice the action and remember the story um, that is being depicted. Now this work was placed in a public square next to the Florence seat of government rather than on the roof line of the Florence Cathedral. We're not exactly sure why that change was made. It might have been they decided that the final work was too beautiful to place at such a far distance, or perhaps it had something to do with um, the politics at the time. Either way, it took four days to move this colossal sculpture, <clears throat> excuse me, this colossal sculpture, um, and it had to be moved with tree trunk rollers through the streets of Florence from Michelangelo's workshop to um, the public plaza. And then it required scaffolding to install on its marble pedestal. Um, so this work really shows the musculature and kind of emotional power. David, again, intensely staring off into the distance, presumably at his enemy um, in preparation for battle. Um, and so this work really took on a political meaning and it became a symbol of Florence, um, a young independent city state, which was at the time at war with another city state, um, Pisa nearby. So David, becomes the symbol of victory, um, victory from the youthful, strong Florence over its enemies, um, and for sort of a symbol of defense of civil liberties within the Republic of Florence. Um, so here, the scale of the work has affected not only its placement, um, but its power and the message that it communicates. Um, there are several copies of this now. The original one is now in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence, Italy. Um, and a replica has been placed um, in the plaza. Having something be larger than life or large scale also forces the viewer to see the things around them differently. Um, we saw this work previously, Maman, um, the spider that's outside of um, the Bilbao Museum in Spain. Um, and it's sort of something that we would expect to be small scale, but blown up, um, depicted on a much grander scale. And in this case, something that is quite unnerving, even at a small scale, um, is now being depicted on a grand, larger than life scale. Klaus Oldenburg and Kuje van der Bruggen, um, who are Swedish and Dutch respectively, um, explore how everyday mass culture items can express truths about modern life. Um, now we saw Oldenburg do this previously um, with his socked toilet, um, with the idea of insignificant or mundane objects um, being transformed. Um, and then along with his partner Van Bruggen, um, they started to play around with scale. Um, they wanted to restyle these overlooked objects um, that were a part of our everyday lives onto a monumental scale in order to give them sort of an air of grandeur and significance that they don't normally have. Um, and doing this really transforms their essence by magnifying the form into something huge and sculptural. Um, so here we have Mistos or um, match cover from 1992. It was in Barcelona, I believe. Um, and so this mundane object, something as simple as a match cover, 
um, that so incredibly monumental in scale that it takes on a whole new sculptural personality. And so these works really challenge the traditional notions of public sculpture. Um, for example, on the left, we have this monumental clothespin that brings the idea of the mundane or perhaps even the private and domestic um, to the forefront. Um, and then on the right, we have this spoon bridge, which is at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Oldenburg had visions of making a giant pair of moving scissors to replace the Washington Monument, as well as creating a colossal peeled banana uh, to go in Times Square. Um, I don't think either of those were ever realized, but he has, in conjunction with his partner, created several of these. Um, and typically they are a bit shocking, or rather it is a shocking experience to have our own sense of scale um, overthrown in such a sort of dramatic way. And scale can really add new meaning to a work. Um, so here we have Dohoso's public figures um, in which the artist has used a manipulated sense of scale to create a statement. Um, here, the scale of the people that are carrying this sculptural pediment is quite diminished in relation to the pediment itself. Now, this is sort of a commentary on public sculpture. Um, so you might notice this looks like a typical pediment that would perhaps hold up a statue of a public hero, maybe a um, maybe a leader on a horse, something kind of heroic, things like that. But instead, that has been purposefully left out. Um, instead of saying, here is a hero who helped protect our country, Do Ho So is saying, here are the hundreds of thousands of individuals who have helped or contributed, those who have done so much and received little to no recognition. Um, and so in this work, there are about 600 small 12 inch figures, both male and female of different ethnicities. Um, and these represent the real people that are behind the heroic gestures. Um, so this work is a great example of how um, small scale can create a sense of intimacy. It sort of invites you to stop and look closer or inspect um, and to really think about what you are seeing. Here are two other works by Dohoso. This is Karma on the left um, from 2003. We have this monumental set of um, legs, kind of dress shoes and slacks connotating business or politics perhaps. Um, and then we have all of these small scale figures that are running from, it looks like, um, running from this large figure or in the back, um, perhaps supporting, but also being crushed by. Um, and really they seem to be being disregarded and they're being stepped on without any care really. So sort of a commentary on perhaps the exploitation of um, common folk by those of higher status or wealth. Um, and then on the right, um, again, we have floor. This is from 2000, kind of similar. Um, though this time we have a grid of glass plates across the gallery floor. Um, and these plates are actually held up by the tiny figures. Um, again, men and women of different ethnicities um, coming together, using their collective strength to support the weight of the individual who stands on top. The scale of a work can sometimes be dictated, at least in part, by the materials used. Um, so here we have Marilyn by Joanna Vasconcelos um, from 2009, um, which is a sort of monumental pair of shoes, a pair of high heels. And can you tell what it's made of? Um, they're actually constructed of saucepans and lids. Um, so why saucepans and lids? Why high heels? Well, the artist here is referencing, oops, sorry. <laughs> the artist is referencing traditional gender roles, um, thinking about women in the private and public spheres, um, how in the private domestic sphere, women are expected to be wives and mothers, um, providers, nourishers. Um, they do the chores, the cooking, the cleaning, the providing um, within the home. 
Um, but their public face is one that is to be beautiful. Um, and so the heels and the title are a reference to um, the American sex icon, Marilyn Monroe. Um, and also kind of making a commentary on the fact that uh, traditionally, women have done all of this work, all of that domestic housework and, and taking care of the family and everything um, while wearing heels um, in order to retain their femininity and beauty. So again, small scale can create a sense of intimacy because it forces the viewer to sort of stop and look closely or perhaps because it requires, um, it requires people to view it one at a time. Um, small scale can also connote craftsmanship or um, sort of intricacy, precision. Um, Slink Up Chew is a London-based street installation and photo artist. Um, he writes, my little people project started in 2006. It involves the remodeling and painting of miniature model train set characters, which I then place and leave on the street. It's both a street art installation project and a photography project. The street-based side of my work plays with the notion of surprise, and I aim to encourage city dwellers to be more aware of their surroundings. The scenes I set up, more evident through the photography, and the titles I give these scenes, aim to reflect the loneliness and melancholy of living in a big city, of almost being lost and overwhelmed. But underneath this, there is always some humor. I want people to be able to empathize with the tiny people in my works. Um, so this slide shows um, a work that was installed in Italy in 2010. This is called Wet and Wild. Um, and so we have this little water slide um, with little figures that are sliding down into the grate here within the sidewalk. Here's another. Um, this one is Stroll from January of 2013 in Moscow, Russia. This one is a bit more gruesome, perhaps, but a nice example of how using small scale can require a bit more effort from the viewer. Um, it would be quite easy to overlook this as you're simply walking down this snow covered street, right? But if you stop and become a little bit more aware of your surroundings, you are treated to a surprise, although a gruesome one in this case. Here's another. This one might actually be um, my favorite of these. Um, this is the Museum. Um, Slinkachu installed this at the Museum of Fine Arts in Ghent um, in 2016. So um, you can see at first glance it appears that someone has simply left their bag on the corner of the couch here in this gallery, but upon closer inspection, the inside of this bag has been transformed um, into a museum. But it's a museum that involves <clears throat> the display of all of these objects that would perhaps be found in a bag like this anyway. Um, credit cards, medication, lipstick, old gum. Um, and so it becomes a museum or a museum all about you or the owner of the bag. Um, or about just humanity in general. And he's done a lot of these. And remember, these are both street art installations and um, photography projects. So the installations themselves won't last forever, but um, he documents them with photography. Um, and it's rather fun to sort of look at the world around you in a different perspective, um, to consider how that tennis ball or how a blade of grass or how a bee would look um, at a different scale. Artists can also use scale to indicate the importance of particular subjects. Um, so here we have Jeanne Van Eyck's Madonna in a Church um, from 1437 and 1438. And he's depicted the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus in this Gothic church. Um, they're surrounded by images that tell the story of the life of Mary and her Immaculate Conception and the birth of Christ. Um, there are images from this story in the windows, um, in the stained glass images here, as well as sort of in the tracery that runs along the top 
Um, and then behind in the altar, and then we have the sort of foreshadowing of what is to come with this image of Christ on the cross here. So notice that Vanek has enlarged the scale of the figures. Um, Mary is actually quite impossibly large. She is taller than um, the archways that lead to the side chapels in this church. Um, and she really fills this space, her head, again, taller than those arches. Um, and this is meant to indicate her spiritual importance um, as the chosen vessel of Christ or of the chosen vessel to birth Christ, I suppose. Um, and then that is reinforced with all of this imagery of her in the background as well. Um, and in this case, it sort of also serves to set her apart from normal human existence. Um, her immense scale indicates that she is more than human. Hierarchical scale is the deliberate use of various relative sizes of forms within a composition um, to communicate differences in importance. Um, this is a technique that ancient artists used a lot. For example, in ancient Egypt, um, the king or pharaoh is usually the largest figure in a composition um, because he had the highest social status or importance. Um, this is the north wall of a great temple of Amun-Ra um, in Karnak, Egypt. It was built in the 19th dynasty, um, circa 1295 to 1186 BCE. Now, um, what kind of relief is this? It's sunken relief, right? If you think back um, to when we talked about the different types of relief sculpture. Um, sunken relief, they haven't cleared out all of the negative space here, right? So, so this relief depicts Seti I, um, the pharaoh at the time, um, in battle against his enemies. Um, and it's quite clear who's the most important character here, right? It's Seti. And he is the most visually dominant of all of the figures, right? He's the largest. He seems to be grabbing an enemy by the hair here um, and is about to hit him with this club. Um, and so notice Seti's scale in sort of relation to the other figures here. Um, figure C is mm, maybe three quarters of his size and seems to be about the same size of this enemy, or would be if this enemy were standing like he was. Um, so the fact that his enemy is not tiny, um, well, that's on purpose. Uh, if he had defeated someone who was super small, like this guy over here, um, it wouldn't be so impressive um, for such, you know, an important kind of large scale figure to defeat such a small scale, unimportant figure. Well, that would be easy. So the enemy needs to be depicted as the second most important um, figure and therefore almost as big as the pharaoh. Now we looked at this work um, briefly when we discussed relief sculpture, um, but we'll look at it a bit more closely now. This is the palette of Narmer. Um, it comes from early dynastic Egypt, circa 2950 to 2775 BCE. Um, it's a palette made of green schist or this sort of green stone. Um, and it is relief carved front and back, very low relief. Um, and it was a palette used for grinding eye paint. So this one was probably never meant for functional use, rather it was probably designed as a ritual object. Um, and so they would have used this sort of circular inset um, as the area to grind up their pigment to make their um, eye paint. This is one of the earliest surviving ancient Egyptian works. Um, and so this palette records the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt under the first Egyptian pharaoh um, King Narmer. So um, 
across the top here, you can see um, these hieroglyphs. We have a horizontal catfish, which is um, the word gnar, um, the hieroglyph for the word gnar. Um, and then underneath, we have this vertical chisel, which is um, the hieroglyph for Mer. So this is the king or pharaoh's name, Nar Mer, in the hieroglyphs across the top here. So we'll start um, with the left side here, the side with the depression for mixing the eye paint. Um, it's divided into four horizontal registers, or these sort of horizontal sections, which are each representative of their own sort of picture plane. Um, in the top, again, we have Narmer in hieroglyphs um, with a bull on either side. And these two horned bulls are symbols of aggression um, and Narmer's strength. Um, in the second register, we have figures, uh, figures lined up along this sort of ground line or baseline. Um, the important figures are placed here. The king is the largest, so using hierarchical scale here. Um, our king, Narmer, is the largest. He has his hieroglyphic name um, next to his head to help identify him. Um, most importantly, he's wearing um, this crown that kind of scoops up almost like a chair, but then it also has this spiral that comes out. Um, so this is a symbol for the red crown of Lower Egypt, meaning that um, Narmer was the king of Lower Egypt. Now in front of him, we have a slightly smaller, though not as small as some of these others, um, figure. So this is likely maybe a general of the army, and there are hieroglyphs there to identify him as well. Um, maybe a general of the army or um, some sort of official seeing over soldiers or perhaps slaves here who are carrying these standards. Um, then over here to the right, we have these stacks um, of smaller figures with their heads. Notice their heads have been decapitated and placed between their legs. Um, so these are the beheaded enemies. Um, maybe a bit hard to tell, but while they are smaller in scale than Narmer, or maybe even than his general, they're slightly larger than the soldiers or the slaves. Um, so they're not the least important in the scene, um, according to hierarchical scale. Now there's one more figure in this, <clears throat> excuse me, in this register, and he stands behind Narmer here. Um, and again, he is smaller in scale than Narmer, maybe about equal in size to the general here. Um, this is his sandal bearer. Um, so he's important, he's an assistant. Um, he's following Narmer around because it was believed that Narmer had the sort of justification of the gods and therefore he was carrying out holy acts. Um, so wherever he goes, he's walking on holy ground, and so he must take off his sandals to do so. Um, so his sandal bearer is here to ensure that um, he has someone to help him out. Now below that, in the third register, we have our circular depression in which the eye makeup would have been prepared. It's sort of framed by these elongated intertwining necks of um, maybe lions, um, which are thought to symbolize the union of Upper and Lower Egypt. Um, and then lastly, at the bottom, we have a bull, again symbolizing um, the might of King Narmer, which Narmer often wears a bull's tail. You can kind of see it hanging off of his backside here and here. Um, <clears throat> but the bull here is trampling yet another enemy um, outside of a fortified city. Now, on the opposite side of this palette, we have a large central scene. Um, so again, here we have Narmer, our king, or our pharaoh, and again shown in hierarchical scale. He's the largest figure in this scene. He's silhouetted against this sort of empty background. This time he wears a sort of conical or maybe bowling pin shaped crown. This is the white crown of Upper Egypt. Egypt, excuse me. And he is 
grabbing his enemy by the hair and preparing to club him over the head, right? Um, but again, this enemy is of similar scale. If he were standing, he might be slightly smaller than Normer um, to emphasize, you know, that he's the second most important figure here. Now, un above this action, we have a falcon. This is representative of Horus. Um, now, this falcon is probably pretty big, uh, kind of large in scale, kind of in comparison to these other figures. So indicating the importance of the gods and their role in Narmer's activities here. Um, the falcon is perched on this sort of papyrus plant or papyrus plant that grows out of this block that also has a head projecting out of it and then there is a rope that wraps around the neck of that head that the, the falcon holds on to um, and so this is meant to symbolize Narmer had the support of the gods on his sort of quest to unify both upper and lower Egypt um, and this is the god Horus helping him do so, kind of combining symbols here to reaffirm Narmer's firm control over both lands. Um, now in this same central scene, here's yet another figure, um, sort of behind Narmer again, though on his own um, ground line, so perhaps meant to indicate there's some distance uh, or some space between them here. Um, but he might look familiar because it is the sandal bearer again, the same sandal bearer from the other side. Um, uh, so again, you might notice Narmer is barefoot because he is um, performing sacred acts and therefore standing on sacred ground. At the bottom, we have um, a small scene in which two fallen enemies have been stripped naked um, and humiliated, essentially. You might also note that most of the figures here are in a composite view, which simply means that each of the parts of the body are shown in their most recognizable or characteristic forms. So the figures, their heads, hips, legs, and feet are in profile. Um, they are sort of striding as to show both legs. Um, and yet the eyes, the shoulders, torso, um, these are frontal as if they're facing forward rather than sort of to the side. Um, this was a general convention in Egyptian art for portraying royals or people of higher status, um, whereas people of lower status would have often been shown in more lifelike um, positions and engaged in active tasks. Um, so the depiction of the sandal bearer in a composite view shows his status, even though he is lower in status than the king. Proportion is the size relations of parts to a whole, or the size in relation to a standard of measurement. For example, ancient Egyptians used the width of a palm as a unit of measurement. Six palms was equal to one cubit, um, the height of the average man was an estimated four cubits or 24 palms. So the proportion of an average man's palm to height was 24 to 1. This canon of proportions was an ideal system that was standard in pictorial relief throughout the Middle Kingdom period. Um, typically, ancient Egyptian art would have been composed in registers. Um, the scenes would have first been sort of laid out with ink lines, um, and the artist would have used a squared grid to guide the proportions of the human figure. Um, for example, here we have the stele of a sculptor named Usurwer um, from the 12th dynasty. Now this is actually unfinished, and you can see um, that in some areas it still has the preliminary underdrawings. The grid was done in red ink, and then the outlines of the figures here were done in black ink. Um, each body part has a designated place on the grid. Um, the figures are typically 18 squares tall from the soles of the feet to the hairline. Um, the tops of their knees meet up with the sixth square up from the bottom, 
whereas their shoulders align with the top of the 16th square, and they are typically six squares wide, whereas their waists are about two and a half squares. The ancient Greeks were also very interested in proportion. Um, they believed beauty was a function of proper proportion, and they studied anatomy closely and selected the most desirable attributes and established beauty ideals such as smooth skin, regular facial features, and specific bodily proportions. Um, one artist, Polykleitos of Argos, created a canon of ideal proportions using a bronze figure to illustrate. Um, so we're looking at a Roman copy made of marble um, uh, after the original bronze um, by Polyphytos, but this is his Doriferous or the spear bearer. Um, so each part of the body um, in this sculpture is a common fraction of the figure's total height. The height of the head is to be one eighth of the total height of the body and the breadth of the shoulders one fourth of the height. Mathematical harmony and proportion was also utilized by Greeks in their architecture. Um, for example, here we're looking at the Parthenon, um, which was built on top of the Acropolis in Athens in the fifth century BC. Um, here they applied the idealized rules of proportion of the human body to the design of architecture. Um, the Parthenon is the largest building on the Acropolis and it was dedicated to Athena Parthenos, or Athena the Virgin. Um, originally, this was begun in about 490 BC, but it was unfinished, and then during the, after the Persian sack, um, Pericles commissioned a larger temple to take its place. So the Parthenon was designed by the architects Callicrates and Ictinos. It was constructed from about 447 to 432 BCE, and it was dedicated in 438 BCE. And the architects utilized balance and proportion as well as other architectural and artistic refinements in order to create a powerful visual embodiment of Athenian democratic ideals and imperial achievement. Um, they've placed a classical emphasis on balance and proportions governed by a strict nine to four ratio, um, which you can also think about this with the formula y equals 2x plus 1. Um, so here we're looking at breadth by length. Um, we have eight columns along the facade or the short side of the Parthenon and 17 columns along the side or the longer side. Um, so if we apply those numbers to the formula, um, y equals 17, x equals 8, 17 equals 2 times 8 plus 1. Um, and then the column bases, um, the diameter is sort of equal to the space between the columns. So we have balance um, in the proportion of the column as well. Now, while the architects applied such precise balance and proportion, they also utilized subtle aesthetic refinements or subtle deviations from absolute regularity. Um, within the Parthenon, there are barely any straight lines or 90 degree angles, um, and the columns tilt just ever so slightly inward. Um, long horizontals, such as in the entablature and the stylobate, they tend to seem to sort of sag from a distance. Um, so to compensate for that, the architects designed these so that they curve upward slightly towards the ends. Um, which creates a countering optical distortion. Um, so these aesthetic refinements help to give the structure a buoyant organic appearance rather than sort of a heavy stone box. Um, so this is very person-centered or humanist architecture. The architects were thinking about the proportions in relation to the human body and the experience of the human visitor. Um, now, the Parthenon also uses another mathematical relationship that fascinated the ancient Greeks, which is the golden section, or sometimes called the golden ratio. Um, so this is a proportional ratio of 1 to 1.618. Um, this ratio occurs naturally in many objects, 
So it was applied to the Parthenon in that the width of the structure is about 1.618 times the height. Um, so the height to width ratio is 1 to 1.618 um, or the golden section or golden ratio. Now, human bodies don't really meet this golden ratio exactly, but applying it to statues results in a more naturalistic kind of idealized proportion. Um, so you can see here the height to width ratio is 1 by 1.618. Um, not quite exact, not quite what it would be in real life, um, but it creates a very convincing um, depiction. So Plato regarded this proportion as the key to understanding the cosmos. And later in the 13th century, Leonardo Fibonacci discovered a series of numbers in which each number, which we now call Fibonacci numbers, is the sum of two preceding numbers. Um, so for example, we can have a Fibonacci sequence of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, etc. Um, so each number can be attained by adding up the two previous numbers in the sequence. 1 plus 1 is 2, 1 plus 2 is 3, and so on. Um, so the ratio between any two sequential Fibonacci numbers actually is equal to the golden ratio, um, 1.618, or slightly closer. Um, the larger the Fibonacci number, the closer the ratio gets to 1.618. Um, also, if you take these nested squares um, based on Fibonacci numbers and based on the golden ratio, they fit together sort of nicely in this elegant spiral shape, um, kind of like this on the left here. And so that spiral shape can then be used to sort of help arrange a composition, as you can see here with the Parthenon. Um, if we overlay that Fibonacci spiral over, we can see how sort of proportional and balanced this composition truly is. And these Fibonacci sequences and spirals also occur in nature. Um, we can kind of think of this as nature's code. Um, the most classic example is the Nautilus shell. Um, it's sort of spiral can be broken down into smaller and smaller sections, which approximate that golden section. Um, but you can also see it in the spirals of sunflower seeds, pineapples, hurricanes, galaxies. Um, and usually it is approximated. Um, it's not exactly 1 to 1.618, um, but it is pretty remarkably close. And artists and architects absolutely love this. Um, many ideas from ancient Greece and Rome that were revived during the Renaissance um, include this numerical relations that held the key to beauty um, and that perfected human proportions um, in order to reflect a divine order. And we can see that um, in these two very famous Renaissance works. On the left, we have Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, and then below to the right, we have Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Um, and both can be overlaid with this Fibonacci spiral. Um, and again, using these numerical relations to sort of unlock the secrets of beauty and kind of perfect human proportion in a relation to divine order. Leonardo da Vinci was in particular quite fascinated with these ideas and more specifically with the ideas of the Roman architect Vitruvius, um, which is illustrated here in da Vinci's Vitruvian Man from 1490. Um, so Vitruvius, he related the perfect male form um, to perfect geometry, and he brought in the idea of the square and the circle. Um, so here in da Vinci's sketch, we have a figure um, within the confines of this square, but the square is actually defined by the height and span of the figure, um, how tall he is from head to toe and then his arm span as well. Um, there's also a circle 
um, also defined by his height and span, um, though the arms and legs are in slightly different position now. Um, and then his navel, um, his belly button, is at the circle's direct center. So perfect geometry can help obtain perfect human proportion, in art at least. But proportion in art is not always true to life. Sometimes it has a more symbolic meaning. Um, we looked at this work, the Vesterbilt Theater or the Rottingen Theater. Um, what has the artist done with proportion here? Well, they've carved both figures to be of similar height. However, Christ is sort of bony and emaciated, um, whereas Mary is sort of a larger looming figure, which this is partly to help alleviate some of the problem of how Mary could possibly support someone of the same size as her on her lap like this. Um, but Pieta, if you remember, means pity or compassion. Um, and it's a scene in which the Virgin Mary supports the body um, of her dead son and mourns over him. So the emphasis on suffering, both in death and the suffering of grief, um, is the overall goal here. So the artist has distorted the proportions of the figures to emphasize that um, their heads are a bit large to make sure that the viewers see the expressions whereas the hands and feet are a bit exaggerated um, to show the stigmata or the wounds um, that Christ bears from his crucifixion. Artists can also change proportions to um, change how we experience a given subject. Um, so here we have Michelangelo's version of the same subject that we were just looking at, um, Pieta. This was really Michelangelo's first major commission um, he was in his early 20s when he created this, and it was commissioned as part of a tomb monument for St. Peter's. Um, so do you notice anything about the proportions of the figures here? So the heads of the two figures are equal in size. However, Mary's body is quite enlarged in relation to that of Christ. Um, her figure sort of spreads out to support him, sort of almost in this horizontal um, plane to support that curve of Christ's limp body. Um, but Michelangelo has disguised um, the immensity of Mary's figure within the sort of deep folds of fabric. If she stood up, she would be at least eight feet tall. Um, monumentally large, especially in comparison to Christ, whose proportions are more anatomically correct. Um, now, there are naturalistic details included um, in both figures, so we don't really notice Mary's misproportion so much, um, but it is there. And we can sort of look at these two works together um, and compare how the proportion changes the perception of the subject. Um, so we have an emaciated version of Christ versus a more muscular or full-bodied Christ, um, though both are hanging quite limply. Um, on the left, it's a more tender depiction, um, whereas on the right, it's tender still um, and very human, but not quite as agonizing or lamenting. Um, rather, Mary seems to have this sense of inner calm, as if she knows already that um, her son will be resurrected. <clears throat> and here are two other great examples of how proportion and scale can be altered or exaggerated to symbolize ideas. Um, so first on the left here, we have Oluwe of Ise's veranda post um, from the Ikere Palace of Nigeria. Um, this was carved in 1910 to 1914. Um, this is an architectural post that features icons of power and leadership amongst the, the Yoruba people in Nigeria. Um, we have an equestrian warrior who sits sort of regally on this very small scale horse. Um, below that, we have a kneeling woman supporting the warrior. Um, now notice the heads of the carved figures are about a quarter of the total figure size. Um, many African cultures associate the head with knowledge um, or personality um, or maybe even identity, we could say. 
Um, but the head is considered the location of a person's spirit or their divine power. Um, so here it represents character, self-control, motivation. Um, the large eyes suggest awareness. Um, notice too, the proportions of the bodies are a bit um, distorted as well. For example, the woman's exaggerated breasts are meant to symbolize the ability to have and nurture children. Um, she's also slightly larger than the warrior in scale, suggesting that she is the essential support um, for him. So without her, he would not be as important as he is. Um, the warrior's horse is small scale, indicating that it's not as important as its rider. Um, and then you might also notice we have these um, two youths at the side of the woman, um, kind of in this subordinate role, or at least suggested so by their smaller scale. Now on the right, we have a figure of an Oni, um, also from Nigeria, um, by an Ife artist, so <clears throat> similar and near. Um, but the Oni is the monarch of the Ifa dynasty of the Yoruba people. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The Oni is the most powerful and important figure in Yoruba culture, and they're shown often in royal, in full royal regalia. Um, again, you might notice the head is about a quarter of the total size of the body, which is to communicate the status and um, sort of destiny of this figure, as well as the Oni's connection to the spiritual realm. This is the seat of the Oni's divine power.